This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. This film, featuring two silent stars at the height of their careers, opens up intriguing questions about the place of fantasy, consumption, and spectacle in popular texts of the 1920s. So this is a section entitled Romance, Fantasy, and the Pleasures of Mise-en-Scene in The Other Rocks. Lynn's novel, to which the film adaptation remains relatively faithful, tells the story of young and beautiful Theodora Fitzgerald, who, to please her family, marries a wealthy millionaire named Josiah Brown. Brown, a chronic invalid many years Theodora's senior, seeks a life of quiet but tolerates his young wife's interest in society, and she meets the charming Lord Hector Brackendale, who falls in love with her. The pair strive to stifle their love for one another, and the refrain of being carried, quote, beyond the rocks to safety, stands in for their attempts to resist the temptations of an adulterous affair. Finally, Josiah Brown's death releases Theodora from her marriage and allows her to be united with Hector at last. The film version of the novel alters the narrative for the purposes of introducing dramatic scenes into a rather staid account of love pursued against the backdrop of society dinners and outings. In the film, Theodora, played by Swanson, is twice rescued by Hector, Valentino, First, when she falls from a boat off the coast of England, and subsequently on the Browns' honeymoon in the Alps, where she joins a friend on a climbing expedition and ends up dangling from a rope until Hector climbs down to her and the pair are eventually pulled to safety. The film makes the most of its choice of location in these scenes and in a historical sequence set at Versailles and inspired by the film's success of the mill. This sequence begins with an intertitle setting the scene and gesturing toward the significance of history and mythology in shaping the scene of romance. Quote, from the gilded glories of the palace, they stroll through the historic gardens and come at last to the arbor of Psyche. Hector observes, it was here the gallants of long ago played their stately games of love. Suppose we call them back again, out of the past. And this frame prompts a temporal move into an historical narrative told by Hector for the imaginative pleasure of Theodora. So now I'd like to show, assuming that I can do this, the first clip.
I know this all goes by very quickly as you may be watching this for the first time. So let me talk about a couple of the features that I think are interesting. Uh, Hector begins, among the Queen's ladies with the little mar marquise, she was bewitching, yet so reserved that she was the despair of all the gallants of the court, until one lover, bolder than the rest. And the medium shot of the two lovers in the present, seated on a stone bench and looking off screen right into the middle distance, dissolves into an imagined procession of royals through the same garments. Among them are Swanson and Valentino, clad in 18th century attire and enacting an elaborate series of courtship rituals. Curtsies and bows, coy glances and entreating looks, culminating in a playfully deferred kiss and a stroll off screen. A sequence concluding by a soft focus wipe that brings the scene back into the present. Hector tries to win Theodora over by not so suddenly reminding her of the comparison between the two sets of lovers, saying, wasn't it fortunate for the bold lover that the heart of the Marquise was as warm as her eyes were tender? And claims her hand for a kiss, saying, you are more beautiful, more bewitching than she. But Theodora pulls away, replying in dismay, oh, Hector, it was all so real, so beautiful, and now. Of course, that's I'm particularly interested in this sequence in the eye lines of the two actors, who seem to use their expressive faces to invoke the journey into a fantasized past in which pleasure is possible rather than prohibited, and in the use of costume and self-conscious display in the fantasy sequence as a contrast to the present, which is marked by restraint and inhibition, or in the case of Hector, in which the expression of love is reprimanded with the threat of its withdrawal. The sequence uses an imagined version of a historical costume drama as a way to play out a fantasy of seduction and pleasure that cannot be realized in reality of the present. A second sequence, some 20 minutes further into the film, depicts Theodore's preparations for a pageant at a country house. I won't take some time to show this, but I'll um, describe it for you, I think, very much in keeping with a similar logic. The program, provided in an intertitle, describes the story as, quote, the romantic drama of how the gallant Sir Claude Lovelace, disguised as a highwayman, held up the York coach, defied her father, and fled with the lovely lady Marjorie Wildacre to Gretna Green. Drawing on the discourse of 18th and the early 19th century seduction plots from the likes of Samuel Richardson, Richardson and Jane Austen, the text positions Theodora as a willing participant in an elopement and shifts quite subtly to a scene in which Hector has taken the place of the man scheduled to play the role of Theodora's suitor and on the coach holds her in his arms as they struggle to again bring their love into submission. Again, this is a performative moment in which the pair comes together yet must separate once more as Theodora concludes. I could never live under the shadow of my broken word, a line that resonates with the storylines of both the fictional couple and their real life counterparts. The following line, this only proves that we are not stronger than our love, references the previous fantasy sequence directly and underscores the fact that their love can only be avowed and then disavowed under the cover of an, an, an imagined romantic drama. And there is pleasure in this deferral of the satisfaction of their desire. The moment of a renewed, more gentle kiss and embrace is as much a celebration of their sacrifice as it is a farewell and denial of the expected ending. Only in the final scenes of the film, which are made possible by the death of Josiah Brown during an exoticized excursion into North Africa, providing an intertextual reference to Valentino's recent success in 1921's The Sheep, only here are Theodora and Hector enabled to be together. The closing shots on a yacht, where notably they have passed the rocks and found their way into the safe waters beyond, are so brief as to suggest that the conventional ending to the romance, though expected, offers rather less in terms of imaginative power than the earlier sequences that capture the pleasurable deferral of desired satisfaction. In their 1968 essay, Fantasy and the Origins of Sexuality, Jean Laplanche and Jean-Bertrand Pontelli articulate an understanding of fantasies of origins based on three scenes, the primal scene, the seduction fantasy, and the castration fantasy. In these cases, the subject is de-subjectivized, that's their term, able to occupy any of numerous positions within the scene. This mode of fantasy differs from the daydream, which restores a minimum of order and coherence to the raw material and imposing on this heterogeneous assortment a facade, a scenario, which gives it relative coherence and continuity. Elsewhere, Laplanche and Pontelli observed that, quote, what, Freud's, what Freud means in the first place by fantasy and are daydreams, scenes, episodes, romances, or fictions, which the subject creates and recounts to himself in the waking state. 
In this view, fantasies are scripts or scenarios of existing scenes capable of dramatization in fictional form, in which the subject is invariably present. It is not an object, oh, sorry, this is a quote as well. It is not an object that the subject imagines and aims at, so to speak, but rather a sequence in which the subject has his own part to play, and in which permutations of roles and attributions are possible. In my reading of the fantasy sequence from Beyond the Rocks, I'm interpreting Swanson and Valentino's enactment of these two paired roles as an explicit mode of identification, though perhaps, as Laplanche and Contoli suggest, there are more places than one to occupy in the playing out of this fantasy. The actors, as well as the spectator, might imagine themselves in multiple subject positions with respect to this magic romance. But I've been especially intrigued by Laplanche and Contoli's description of fantasy as, quote, not the object of desire, but the setting. In fantasy, the subject does not pursue the object or its sign. He appears caught up himself in the sequence of images. He forms no representation of the desired object that is himself represented as participating in the scene, although in the earliest forms of fantasy, he cannot be assigned any fixed place in it. The scenic quality of this imagined fantasy, which after all capitalizes on its ability to craft a romantic scene through elaborate costumes, sets, and other aspects of mise en scène, is particularly well suited for a film that made the most of the pairing of its glamorous stars. Indeed, I would argue that at its peak in the early 1920s, silent cinema was uniquely able to capture the scenic nature of desire and to connect that scenic quality to a discourse that united stars, fans, and studios in perpetuating the association between adornment, display, desire, and pleasure. And with her background and ability to remake herself, Eleanor Glynn was uniquely well positioned to respond to the call that associated such scenes of display with the pleasures of consumption. Eleanor Glynn had a secure connection to a growing culture of fashion and consumption at the turn of the century. Her sister was the society dressmaker Lucille, Lady Duff Gordon, well known then as now for her gowns, her style, and her much publicized escape from the Titanic in an almost empty lifeboat. Among other claims to fame, Lucille claimed to have invented the use of shop assistants as live mannequins. Although the French couturier Gagelin had apparently used Demoiselle de Magasin to display certain articles of clothing in 1849, Lucille's emphasis on the theatrical and erotic potential of the mannequin was crucial to the development of the store employee as display object. In their book Theater and Fashion, Joel Kaplan and Sheila Stowell described Lucille's use of the paraphernalia of stage representation ramp, curtains, wings, limelight, and music to establish a voyeuristic bond between mannequin and spectator. That was a brief quote that sets up now a longer quote from their work in which they're also quoting Lucille's own description of this display. Her mannequins of jeweled de Mayo or undergarments of rigid black satin reaching from chin to feet, conventionally worn by couture house models. Nor were they shot in unappetizing laced boots. Lucille's response was to recruit and train her own core of glorious, goddess-like girls, drawn largely from the working-class suburbs of the East and South London. Selected for the kind of full-busted, long-limbed figures Lucille would help to make popular, each was drilled in carriage and deportment before being given a sonorous stage name like Gamma or Dolores. By the decade's close, many would be celebrities in their own right, the first supermodels in an emerging couture house industry. Instead of the common practice of using numbers to identify particular gowns, Lucille adopted titles like Passion's Thrall, Do You Love Me, and A Frenzied Song of Amorous Things, and Eleanor Glenn prepared descriptive text to accompany the spectacle. The popular novelist Marie Corelli, writing The Bystander on 27th of July, 1904, described one such event thus. Not very long ago, there was held a wonderful symposium of dress at the establishment of a certain movie was intensely diverting, entertaining, and instructive. A stage was erected at one end of the long room, and on that stage, with effective flashes of limelight played from the wings at intervals, and the accompaniment of a Hungarian band, young ladies wearing creations in costumes stood, sat, turned, twisted, and twirled, and finally walked down the room between rows of spectators to show themselves and the gowns they carried off to the best possible advantage. The whole thing was much better than a stage comedy. Nothing could surpass the quaint peacock-like vanity of the girl mannequins who strutted up and down, moving their hips to accentuate the fall and flow of flounces and draperies. There was a program of the performance, fearfully and wonderfully worded, the composition so we were afterwards with bated breath informed, 
of Madame Lamoudi's sister, a lady who, by virtue of having written two small, rather clever skits on the manners, customs, and modes of society, is, in some obliging quarters of the press, called a novelist. This program instructed us as to the proper views we were expected to take of the costumes paraded before us." As Corelli and others would observe, it was significant that men as well as women were invited to attend this spectacular performance of fashion, displayed on the bodies of women who were themselves as much objects of desire as clothing. Certain, quote, certain flanners of Bond Street, various loafers familiar to the Carlton Lounge and celebrated Piccadilly trotters, form nearly one half of the audience and stared with easy indolence at the red mouth of a venomous flower or smiled suggestively at incessant soft desire. They were invited to stare and smile, and they did, but there was something remarkably offensive in the way they did it. <laughs> Here, as in the shops and department stores in which women worked long hours behind the counter, there is an associative link between the glamour of the gowns and that of the women, as often termed girls, wearing them such that the model, chosen for her physical characteristics, becomes identified with the garment, both readily available for the right price. Much of the work of social reform organizations during this period was explicitly designed to address the resulting anxieties about the potential risks of prostitution, whether literal or figurative, in a trade where women workers were thought to be among the goods on offer. At the same time, however, this kind of scene invokes the presence of a certain form of contained sexuality within the phenomenon of glamour, that Peter, Peter Bailey has termed parasexuality. And I quote this uh, definition, he defines it as, quote, an extensive ensemble of sites, practices, and occasions that mediate across the frontiers of the putative public-private divide. Arguably, it is here, in such everyday settings as the pub, the expanding apparatus of the service industries, and a commercialized popular culture, that capitalism and its patriarchal managers construct a new form of open yet licit sexuality. In vulgar terms, it might be represented as everything but, unquote. In the spaces of the fashionable department, fashionable department store and in the environments of new leisure entertainments like the Southern Cinema, such forms of controlled sexual expression were associated with a modern female sexuality that centered on the notion of women claiming their status as simultaneous objects and subjects of desire. As Elizabeth Lee notes, Lucille's approach to staging fashion as a spectacular display was integral to the the development of the early film genre of the fashion serial. In films such as The Strange Case of Mary Page and The Adventures of Dorothy Dare, action would be stopped at intervals to, to describe the heroine's gowns. As I've argued elsewhere, fashion and film were used to advertise one another's appeal in the first decade of the 20th century, as early fashions on Brighton Pier from 1898 and Paris Fashion from 1910, the titles of several surviving films in the BFI archives, attest. These points to the significance of a documentary called 50 Years of Paris Fashion, 1859-1909, the audience's experience of which is described in the bioscope's de depiction of, quote, a lady sitting in a picture theater imagining that she is in the showroom of a fashionable modiste with the mannequins walking around for her inspection, unquote. In this way, the culture of consumer fantasy and the emergent discourses of spectacle and display in silent cinema are intimately so I think now might be a good time for me to um, take out this disc and put in the other one. So brief interruption, so that I can move on to the discussion of it. Uh, so two quotes to begin the section. One is from Elizabeth Beardley 
Beer City Butler's Sales Women in Work Control Stores from 1909, and the second from a um, popular novel called Winnie Child's The Shop Girl from 1914. So the first is, I learned how to talk up to people and to tell them positively that it is the style and to have an air, you know, when you show things. First, I used to just hand up the suits and watch the other sales ladies, but before long, I was selling too, for I was tall enough to be on the floor. Um, and the second quote is, I got the engagement only by a few extra inches. Luckily, it isn't the face that matters so much. I thought it was, but it's legs. They're being long. Madame Nadine engages on that, and your figure being right for the dresses of the year. So many pretty girls come in short or odd lengths, you find, when they have to be measured by the yard at bargain price. <laughs> These excerpts, the first from a sociological report, the second from a popular novel, strike a familiar note in the literature on female department store employees in the United States in the first decades of the 20th century. Both texts emphasize the importance of appearance and style, having an air in the practice of successful selling. Both also suggest an associative connection between the shop girl and the commodities she sells. The 1927 Simon film It, written by Eleanor Blinn and starring Clara Bow in the film that would forever identify her as the It Girl, likewise makes this connection, but to different ends. Whereas the text from which the above excerpts are drawn imply an implicit critique of the department store as the site of exploitative labor, It skirts this critique in order to claim an alternative discourse of female empowerment based on women's active, desiring gaze. In this sense, the film is something of an anomaly, both in its visual representation of the agency of its shop girl flapper heroine and in its delimited moment. By the 1930s, the popular film of discourse around the shop girl reverts to a moral binary that turns on sexual knowledge and power, or the lack thereof. So a bit of historical context. With 19th century urbanization and industrialization came the rise of the American department store. Marshall Fields in 1852, Macy's 1858, Bloomingdale's 1872, Wanamaker's, Gimbal's, many others, and a series of transformations in the industry, from the small dry goods shops of the 1850s to the department store boom of the 1870s and 1880s, from bargain stores to elite establishments catering to the carriage trade, and from fabric and ribbon to ready-to-wear garments for both sexes, and thus to the consumer boom of the early 20th century. Jan Whitaker estimates that Sales of consumer goods roughly tripled in just the 20 years between 1909 and 1929, and notes that by 1929, about 500 of the 4,000 or so total number of department stores nationwide had an annual volume of over $1 million. Throughout this period, in the face of rising costs and increased competition, the department store played a pivotal role in the growing culture of consumption. As Nicholas Daly observes, a fundamental aspect of the appeal of this newly integrative national consumer culture was its linkage of commodity-based happiness with the modern sexuality of the American girl. And at the center of this discourse of modern feminized consumption was the figure of the shop girl. As Susan Porter Benson has shown, the department store offered new opportunities to young working class women seeking employment in urban centers. Roland Macy began hiring women shop assistants in 1869, but department stores were largely staffed by men until the 1890s, when women increasingly entered the trade, both as clerks and eventually as buyers. Although female sales clerks were often poorly paid and suffered under rigid systems of rules, fines, and penalties for even the most minor infractions, the promise of the department store was based on the assumed connection between femininity, class mobility, and consumer desire. Hence, writers frequently emphasize the shop girl's love of dress and finery, a popular perception resulting in efforts on the parts of store management to educate women workers in good taste and proper behavior on the sales floor. This was a pedagogical approach designed to make the shop girl into a proper version of herself so that she might better educate customers in the art of consumption. The aim here, too, was to erase difference by assimilating a diverse, although still racially segregated, population of women into a visual display of conformity that would mimic the carefully managed display of merchandise. As Elizabeth Beardsley Butler observed in a 1909 study of department stores in Baltimore, Maryland, quote, the saleswoman in a small specialty house or in a neighborhood store is a cog in a small wheel, just as the saleswoman in a, in a department store is a cog in a large wheel, unquote. In tension with these discourses of homogeneity and uniformity in which the sales girl is reduced to a cog in a wheel, one of many, 
is the fictional narrative that features the shop girl as the heroine of a heterosexual romance plot linking social mobility, sexual desirability, and marriage. In the department store, the classic narrative is one in which the impoverished but morally virtuous sales girl falls in love with the store owner, manager, or a young and rising star on the male staff. Lori Landay describes this narrative as, quote, one of the central myths of the female American dream. The working girl marries the boss and never has to work again. But also, and increasingly, the shop girl comes to figure as an agent of her own story, whether her narrative focuses on love or career. For the latter, we may look to the case of Mae Williamson, an employee at a store in Baltimore, Maryland, who was a signer to an early closing petition, and though she married and left her job as a first floor saleswoman, she subsequently left her husband and took a new position as a stock girl, finding it advantageous to work her way up in a new environment. And I quote, you can always make more if you leave and go to another firm. Your own firm won't raise you because they think they've got you. I've changed several times and I've always made it count for me. In my analysis of Clara Bow's performance as Betty Lou Spence in It, I explore another narrative of making one's labor count. In her progress from one side of the counter to another, Betty Lou insists upon being the subject as well as the object of sexual and consumer desire. In important ways, this marks a revision of the story of the shop girl, whose foundations lie in the late 19th century. The figure of the flapper, the newly enfranchised, financially independent, and socially adventurous modern young woman, intersects with traditional narratives of the shop girl romance in surprising ways. In what follows, I want to read Glynn's 1927 film, It, as a narrative in which it, the, the word, suggests the shop, shop girl's desirability and positioning as one of the goods on display. As one of the male suitors for Betty Lou Spence's affections explains while opening her, look, if I ever saw it, that's it. But also as a reworking of this narrative as one in which the shop girl, too, acts as a desiring subject. In this context, the narrative of the shop girl is invested with encoded sexuality. The presence of a young woman behind the store counter conveys the sense of being available, like the goods on display. Yet in Glynn's reworking of the shop girl's story, this sense of controlled availability is one managed by the woman herself. For Glynn, this carefully managed sexuality, or parasexuality in Bailey's terms, was embodied by what she termed it, which in much writing on her work has been reduced to only one of its meanings, sex appeal. Undoubtedly, Glynn did see it as linked to sexuality, and especially physical attractiveness. In a February 1926 interview in Photoplay, she declaimed, quote, It is the peculiar fascination possessed by men much oftener than women, which makes them immensely attractive to all women and even men. It is largely to do with animal magnetism. The person who possesses it is always utterly unselfconscious and perfectly indifferent and unaware of anyone's interest in him. It is one of the rarest gifts in the world. But as Nicholas Daly notes, Glenn's conception was also informed by the late 19th century interest in mesmerism, spiritualism, and popular science, linking the scientific conception of sexual attraction as a powerful and irrational force with the more familiar materials of love and romance. Although she first defined the concept of it in her 1914 novel, The Man in the Moment, Glenn elaborated the description more fully in the preface to her 1926 novella, It, which was serialized in Cosmopolitan before being published in book form. Here, it is described as that strange magnetism which attracts both sexes, of which the fortunate possessor must be entirely unselfconscious and full of self-confidence, indifferent to the effect he or she is producing and uninfluenced by others. In this case, the possessor of it is the male protagonist, John Gaunt, whose powerful attraction merely mesmerizes the heroine, the impoverished Ava Cleveland, who eventually submits to his charms. Lynn reworked this story for the film, discarding the figure of John Gaunt and transposing her setting from the homes and haunts of wealthy society figures, among whom Ava Cleveland wanders like Edith Wharton's Lily Bart, to the floor of a New York department store, where Betty Lou Spence, played by Claire Beau, works behind the lingerie counter. Betty Lou is first noticed by Monty, a wealthy man about town and friend of the son of the store owner, Cyrus Waltham. Monty cannot, however, compete with Waltham, who immediately becomes the focus of Betty Lou's attention and the remainder of the narrative turns on her ability to woo and win him. Since this is a Hollywood romance, she does so in due course, after losing him to a misunderstanding, seeking her revenge, falling off his yacht, and rescuing his fiancé from drowning. <laughs> the lovers are united as they cling to the yacht's anchor with the word it, part of the obscured yacht's name, Itola, between them. What interests me here, though, are not so much the ways in which the heroine manages to get her man, but the fact that her interest in him emerges on the shop floor and is articulated, articulated in a discourse that links consumption, 
especially the consumption of goods associated with femininity in the female body, with visibility, sexual attractiveness, and female sexual desire. I've just noticed I've had Wolf come up on the screen the whole time with his powerful presence, so <laughs> you're looking on with him above you. Um, Clara Bow was an ideal choice for the part of Betty Lou Spence, as she was positioned within an emergent fans and star culture associated with the pleasures of consumption. Bow had been discovered when she entered a fan magazine competition that granted finalists a screen test and interviews with prospective agents. By the mid-1920s, she had starred in several previous films, including The Plastic Age from 1925, Dancing Mothers 1926, and Mantrap from the same year. Critics then as now emphasized Bow's dynamic, kinetic performance style, underscoring the collapse of star and character, which in turn benefited the two influential women involved in the film. Pro producer Bud Schulberg reportedly paid Clint $50,000 to promote Bo as the embodiment of it. For the remainder of her career, Clara Bo was known as the it girl, a phrase still used to signify the combination of celebrity, style, and presence associated with Hollywood glamour. The film uses intertextuality to full effect to define the power of it. In the first scene, the dandyish Monty enters Waltham's office waving a copy of Cosmopolitan, a close-up of which reveals the phrase that defines the term. This quote is not in the novel and appears to have been crafted specifically for the film. As a result, Monty is convinced he himself is the possessor of it, preening in the mirror in a way that encodes his version of it with an effeminate subtext that precludes his ability to function as the eventual romantic lead. Since the film expects us to laugh at Monty's self-conscious performance of it, and since Waltham is apparently completely unselfconscious in his masculinity, Monty serves as a facilitator of a romance that will not be his own. And in the end, Monty is paired off awkwardly with Waltham's cast-off fiancé, both designated Idless Its. Monty follows Waltham down to the main floor of the department store, where Monty examines each sales girl, girl in turn to determine whether she too has it. So I have two scenes that I discuss here, and I discuss the second one first, but I thought I'd show the whole clip, and then I'll talk about them sort of in reverse order. <laughs>
still all them. I've inspected all the lady employees and not one of them has it. Monty proceeds along the hosiery counter, where disembodied mannequin legs modeling stockings stand on the counter in front of a series of saleswomen, all of whom are in different stages of folding and unfolding hosiery. Monty looks each woman up and down, and each woman meets his gaze, displaying various degrees of interest that are inflected with self-conscious performance. One, one woman pats her hair as he looks on, another leans forward with raised eyebrows as if to challenge his gaze. Monty's apathetic response suggests to the viewer that these women do not meet his definition of it. But I would also suggest that the seriality of this display, each individual mannequin leg accompanied by a shop assistant of similar height, dress, and appearance with only minor variations, serves to underscore the affiliation of the shop girl with the goods she sells and with the culture of consumption, in which women are also erotic objects to be evaluated and potentially consumed. Yet the film resists his discourse of the shop girl as an object of desire, granting Betty Lou Spence and her fellow shop girls a significant degree of agency associated with the power to look and eventually to acquire. I have noted the way in which the shop assistants behind the hosiery counter meet Monty's gaze in a way that's very different from the deference that might typically be expected of a store employee greeting a customer. Indeed, several of the women seem to evaluate him with their own responsive gaze and find him lacking. Another example from the same extended scene foregrounds the female shop assistant's ability to claim a desiring gaze of her own. Just prior to the sequence at the hosiery counter, we've been introduced to Betty Lou Spence in conversation with a couple at the lingerie counter, holding a chemise against her body to model it for the female customer. After a cut to Waltham, who's walking the floor with two other businessmen, we return to a medium close-up of Betty Lou, now accompanied by another sales girl who explains in an intertitle, Hot Socks, the new boss. In a shot-reverse shot structure, Betty Lou sees Waltham and reacts with a mobile, desiring gaze, her directional look reinforced by the eyeline match of the subsequent shot. A medium close-up of Waltham is followed by a medium shot of Betty Lou leaning on the counter, looking longingly at Waltham with nine other sales girls behind her, all accompanying her, all accompanying her and actively gazing upon him. Another parallel series of shot and reverse shot enables the camera to move gradually into a close-up of Betty Lou, whose eyes scan Waltham up and down, and his intensified breathing underscores her amorous response, culminating in the intertitle, Sweet Santa Claus, Give Me Him. Here I would argue that Betty Lou is simultaneously likened to her fellow shop assistants, one among many women behind the counter, all of whom claim the position of active possessors of a female gaze, yet also differentiated from them highlighted through these close-ups and the conventions of classical Hollywood cin cinematographic language. Indeed, the romance of the shop girl, which turns on her ability to attract the boss, frequently the son of the store owner, as in this case, is predicated on her ability to stand out from the crowd, to attract and hold his gaze. The remainder of the film's plot depicts Betty Lou's efforts to make Walton notice and eventually propose to her. Not, or not only, because marriage to him would offer her a path from one side of the counter to the other, but also, I would argue, because her desire forms the central structure and motivation. At one point, Waltham comes so close to Betty Lewis to lean on the counter, with his elbow on one of the articles of clothing she's selling. She tugs on it, hoping to attract his attention, but he does not notice. At this point, she's merely another employee. It is only when Betty Lou manages to enlist Monty to take her to dinner at the Ritz, where Eleanor Blaine appears herself in a cameo stolen the merchants of it, that Betty Lou finally succeeds in capturing Waltham. Crucially, she does so wearing a short, 20s-style cocktail dress that she's cunningly fashioned from her store uniform. Here, the scissors associated with dressmaking, another long-standing form of women's work, become the tool to transform the shop girl into the flapper and eventually to transcend her class position. And I'm really, I won't show the sequence, but I'm really interested in it as well because as she, with the assistance of um, her roommate, who is an unmarried mother and that engages a whole um, a different narrative, uh, they remake the gown and then she kind of performs this new image of the flapper, so it really is a sort of transformation affected through the, the tr changing of her uniform into this stylish uh, cocktail dress. Throughout her performance, Clara Bow renders Betty Lou not as the unselfconscious possessor of it, which in a commentary on Glynn's perception, uh, conception here becomes an outmoded Victorian view of sexual attractiveness as inherent but unacknowledged. But rather, um, I, I read Clarabeau's performance as an entirely self-conscious and self-aware modern woman claiming access to sexual subjectivity. 
For the 1920s, this is a radical revision of female sexual agency in keeping with the rise of the flapper and the sense of possibility embodied by the years leading up to the stock market crash of 1929. By the 1930s, many of the moralizing discourses of the shop girl return. In Hollywood films from this later period, the shop girl figures as either a moral but victimized employee of an abusive, sexually rapacious employer, or as a gold digger whose working class status is interwoven with her dubious sexual morality. And in the version of this piece that's forthcoming, um, I talk about two other films from the 30s, 1933's Employee's Entrance, and then 1939's The Women. In these films, the shop girl remains at the center of a network of associations with the department store with financial gain, sexual desirability, consumption, and display, but her story becomes refocused in such a way as to close down the possibilities raised by it. Instead, the shop girl figures of these films mark a return to earlier narratives that bifurcate the shop girl's story into one contrasting sexual innocence and moral reclaimability with sexual knowledge and irredeemability. Um, I'd be delighted to talk further about these films and related topics uh, in the Q&A, but for now, I think I'll stop there. And thank you very much.